Namaskar. Uh, today, uh, we are going to start our webinar on how big is our universe. Uh, and uh, today we have special guest, uh, Professor Dr. Udayraj Khanal with us to share about uh, the universe and its uh, components. So uh, for, for a couple of minutes, uh, for an hour, um, we are going to explore about the universe and those who have questions about uh, the universe during the presentations. They can ask uh, writing questions uh, in the uh, uh, Q&A section. So welcome to uh, this uh, webinar on uh, how big is our universe uh, with Professor Dr. Udayaraj Khanal. Uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Dr. Udayaraj Khanal uh, in brief. Uh, he did his uh, senior Cambridge from St. Javier's College, Jalakil, and then he moved to USA and then uh, studied his BSc from uh, Florida Atlantic uh, University. And after that, he moved to uh, India, New Delhi, uh, from where he studied a master's in science, MSc, MPhil, and PhD at uh, Delhi University. Uh, after completing his education in India, he returned to Nepal and joined Truman University as a faculty and served uh, uh, there for about 34 years. And uh, uh, he's uh, still active uh, doing the research. Uh, doing his, So after, after completing uh, his education, uh, he came uh, back to Nepal and joined the university and where he served uh, as a faculty uh, for many years, more than three decades. And uh, recently he got retired from the, from the university, but he's still active in research and his specialization lies in the field of cosmology. Uh, so far as we know, that he is the only cosmologist in the country working in the same domain. Uh, since he got retired from, from the university, and now students cannot study cosmology, cosmology at uh, Truman University. So uh, to, uh, with this uh, brief note, uh, let's welcome uh, today our special guest and speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Udaraj Kanal, sir. Sir, welcome to the webinar. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Suresh for organizing this seminar. Uh, well, the title is very interesting. You gave me the title, how big is the universe? And uh, I don't know how much justice I can do uh, to this uh, whole thing. I have not made the uh, talk very technical. I tried to Rather than the big universe, I've tried to discuss these uh, large numbers that seem to occur when we study the universe. Uh, so uh, I start here with my very old work. Uh, this, I did my PhD on Hawking radiation basically studying the perturbation of the black hole. And uh, after I came from back from Delhi to Kathmandu, I joined the physics department at uh, Thiruvan University and basically tried to continue what I had been doing in my, during my PhD uh, on studying the uh, perturbation, gravitational perturbation of the black hole, uh, generally just uh, space-time, curved space-time, general relativistic space-time. And uh, this paper was published in Physical Review in 1983. I sent it sometime in 82. I submitted my PhD in February and this I sent 82. Uh, it was a very at that time, no, no communication like at present. I had to type it out, leave space for the symbols, all the uh, Greek letters and so on. 
and then write the letters with hand and then send that paper. Then they send those to the referees and then after the referee has given the okay, and then they said uh, they accept the paper. But you note almost one year difference between the submission of the paper and its publication. Uh, physical review demands what are called uh, uh, publication charges. Uh, if you pay it, uh, I think some uh, qu quite a lot, it amounted in dollars quite a lot, so much per page, then they publish it quickly. Otherwise, they keep it and publish it as uh, the time goes by. So I'm showing this paper here because uh, I think as far as I know, this must be the first paper in a journal like Physical Review from published from the uh, through from the uh, from our university from Trivandrum University in Nepal, and furthermore, uh, I feel very happy to say that this paper is one of my most highly cited papers. Over thirty citations are uh, still continuing today. Uh, just recently, I got information that it has been cited in a, a recent work. And this paper has been cited in PhD thesis from Harvard University to many other universities. So uh, then again, I continued, well, not really continued. I work some papers, maybe one paper, two paper every five or 10 years. And then at the, uh, towards the end of my career in the university, maybe some 10 years or so before I retired, uh, I thought maybe this, this is a very interesting method, Newman Penrose method to part of the uh, general relativistic Einstein's equations and uh, I thought maybe it could be tried with the universe itself. Why only with the black hole? Maybe with the universe itself and uh, I basically got the equations and uh, uh, then uh, I got the equations. I got two of my students to solve them and worked out the details. And uh, they have received their PhD on that. Uh, and with that work, my son was studying in Carnegie Mellon, Pittsburgh. And I went there to meet him and uh, arranged for a seminar at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, fortunately, one of the person here, Newman, uh, he, uh, he is, he was a, he's a, I think a professor emeritus at Pittsburgh University. And he turned out in the, audience. Uh, at that time, I, I had never seen any picture of Newman. Uh, Penrose is in Oxford. Uh, so I didn't recognize him. And he asked at the end of my talk, he asked a few questions to me. I don't know, I gave some answers. And then he left the room. And uh, some people there who were in attendance, they said, oh, you are talking about Newman. That is Newman. And then I ran out of the room. Uh, fortunately, caught him as he was waiting for the lift. And uh, I talked a few minutes. 
and I told him that I'd like to meet with him and talk in more detail. So uh, I went to him and uh, he's one of the biggest uh, physicists that I have met. Okay, with this, I'd like to go back to the topic in hand, uh, talking about the bigness of the universe. Uh, big is actually a relative term. We mostly compare things with our own size and uh, what we see around. And our measurement, the units of measurement of the basic units, the fundamental dimensions, length, uh, mass, and time were devised according to what we experience. So for example, a meter is maybe slightly shorter than our height. So something we can relate to very easily. Uh, considering about big and small, they, uh, in the lab, I think this was sometime in the 50s or the 60s, they were doing what is called deep inelastic scattering. And they could see scattering centers inside the nucleons. So at that time, Fermi developed the pattern model to describe the scattering experiments. And later on, they are overtaken by what are called quarks. So basically, in these uh, scattering experiments, people were measuring length scales down to 10 to the minus 15 meter, femtometer, the size of the nucleus with quarks inside them. Uh, on the large side, this is a very recent a discovery uh, a couple of years ago. The most distant galaxy that has been observed is uh, 10 to the, is 13.39 giga light years away, 10 to the 19, uh, 10 to the uh, 10 to the 9 giga is 10 to the 9 so in our thing it is arab 10 to the 9 is arab uh, light years away uh, similarly for the mass the best thing they could think of was water that is readily available, familiar everywhere, available everywhere. And after the meter was devised, it turns out a meter cubed of water weighs quite a lot, thousand kilos, so that we cannot relate to it very much. So they divided this thousand kilo one into one part and call that one kilogram. Uh, nowadays, labs all over the world and mostly, most prominently, there are a number of things, I think one in, uh, uh, in the poles, trying to measure the neutrino mass, the ice cube experiment, and one in Japan, the Kamio Kande experiment, trying to measure the mass of the lightest particle that is around the neutrino, whose mass is expected to be of the order of 10 to the minus 36 kilograms. And on the large side again, 
the most massive superstructure, the astronomical structure that has been discovered again just I think a few years ago has been called the El Gordo cluster and it contains almost 10 to the more than I think 10 to the 15. I just kept the order. There are some um, factors multiplying that. So more than 10 to the 15 solar masses. That is one galaxy containing more than 10 to the 15 uh, the galaxy cluster. This is a cluster, sorry. Uh, 10 to the 15 solar masses. I think the total mass of this universe is something like around 10 to the 24 or so uh, solar mass. Similarly with the time, uh, the basic unit is the day from one sunrise to another. And again, they divided this into, uh, there are many units, but the one that we use nowadays, 24 hours and 24 hours again very big when you are sitting around uh, sometimes it time passes very slow so that you could measure smaller units of time and we have the second uh, the smallest time they are able to measure uh, it started i think with the femtosecond spectroscopy that got Nobel Prize sometime in the 1990s, I think. I don't remember the exact date. Uh, they were studying the interaction of chemical interactions of atoms, the forming and breaking of bonds in molecules. And uh, they were able to do the femtosecond spectroscopy. They could see atoms in the molecules forming bonds and breaking in time scales of femtosecond that got the Nobel Prize. And then nowadays, the shortest laser pulses that have been made, uh, this was in 2017, is, uh, are these uh, at a second laser pulses. I, th I think the 43 at a second is the shortest one. Maybe it has become smaller, I don't know, but this is the data I have found. And obviously the longest time we can think of is the age of the universe itself, which is 13.8 giga, giga years, billion years, almost um, 14 billion years. So uh, the first thing I told you, the most distant galaxy is 13.39 giga, giga light years away. And the Hubble horizon is 13.8 giga light years big. So the galaxy I had written in the first point here is almost at the edge of the universe. Uh, now, some more details. This scale that is used in physics, the magnitude scale 10 to the power is very deceptive. We can write down any number 10 to the power of anything we want, and we don't actually get the scale uh, that goes with it, I've just, it is a logarithmic scale and you know the logarithm, it saturates at high values, the plateaus off. So, uh, so uh, the notation I've just written here, I think all of you are familiar with it. 10 to the zero is one, 10 to the three is, 10 to the any power is one followed by that many zeros and 10 to the minus three is one by 10 to the three, which is two zeros before a one. 
with a decimal point, a decimal point followed by two zeros and a one. So I have written a very simple example here. I think all of you are familiar with the ring road around Kathmandu. I've rounded it off to 30 kilometer. I think they say some 27, some point something kilometer. And uh, I round it off to 30 just to make it easy to do calculation. You multiply that by 10, you get the road distance to Biratnagar, which is quite far away. And again, you multiply that by another 10, you get half the Earth's radius and multiply that by 100, 10 to the two, you almost reach the moon. And 500 times that is the distance to the sun, 150 million kilometers. And 100,000 times that is one light year. So the nearest star that is the nearest star to the sun is about four light years away. So when you multiply by 10 uh, number of times, things increase very quickly. And I told you earlier, the Hubble radius is 13.8 uh, giga light years. Uh, these large numbers are very interesting. Later on, I'll just mention about what is called the Dirac large number hypo hypothesis, but uh, it is very difficult to even imagine these numbers. Uh, everyone knows the Avogadro number. Some have left out the factor in front, some 10 to the 23. Uh, one mole consists of 10 to the 23 atoms in it. So atoms are molecules. And just 18 gram of water contains 10 to the 23 molecules, which is quite a big number, uh, just unimaginably big, I think. Uh, Mathematically, you can think of any big number. You give me any number, I can always uh, uh, call out a number that is bigger than that. But unless you can measure it, uh, uh, unless it represents something physical, it doesn't have any meaning. It just becomes very abstract and uh, uh, don't carry much meaning. So I have another example here of the measurement of time devised by our uh, ancestors. Uh, this value I've taken from what is called the, the largest number they devised is called uh, Parartha. And let me try to explain how they come about this number. Uh, there are many things. I, I think I was very small, I think just going to school maybe in two or three class, when I asked my father, what is the biggest number that is? And he said, oh, it is Parartha. And he read out some slopes that there is no way to count beyond Parartha and so on. So uh, later on, I tried to find out what this Parartha meant. And I came across this Haribamsa Puran, which gives the uh, calculation up to Parartha. The time. There are shorter time spans uh, called Truti and so on, but in the Haribamsa Puran, they start out with 
one nimesh which is defined as the blink of an eye and i looked around it says maybe around 90 millisecond or 100 i rounded it off again to make it simple 100 a blink of an eye maybe about 100 millisecond then from that they say how many of these nimes make up a day then what is called the paksha the moon the waning and the waxing of the moon the sukla paksha and the uh, krishna paksha uh, one fortnight uh, two weeks about two weeks then they give a number for how many nimes in a month and so on and then a year and then they say that our one year is equivalent to one uh, divine year the divine day day and night the six months when the sun comes from the southern hemisphere seems to come from the southern hemisphere towards the north uh, that is called the day of the gods and when it goes back to the south uh, it is called the night so one or one year is said to be a day of day and night of the gods then 12000 these year years of the god is one satur you for yugas the uh, satya uh, treta dwapar and kali you and thousand of these chatur yug amounts to one day of brahma and this is called a uh, kalpa so multiplying them all out i get a number around six times 10 to the 17 and this many nimesh in one kalpa which turns out to be about uh, four and a half billion years uh, so uh, well maybe it is a coincidence but the age of the universe is 10 to the 17 not nimesh but uh, seconds 10 to the of the order of 10 to the 17 seconds uh, and this 10 to the 17 is called the parardha parardha artha is half so para means beyond half of something beyond and uh, brahma sleeps for another parardha as he wakes up there is creation the universe is created and as he sleeps the uh, universe dissolves into him and uh, according to this i think if you look in our patro they say some uh, two point uh, the srishti gatobda they call it uh, some two point some billion years so it appears that brahma is in his midday at present uh, then the counting goes even further and it says that Vishnu sleeps in his Narayan Nidra for thousand Brahma years. So you can imagine how these numbers are uh, increasing. Uh, I tried to find out what Shiva's day amounted to. I could not get any confirmation of all the above thing i have written is in haribamsa puran and many other puranas as you may have you may if you want to confirm it but this one i have not confirmed but somewhere i saw that uh, in each breath of shiva is a lifetime of vishnu and so on so uh, this is how they counted large numbers at that time 
up. And more interesting thing, after Hubble found out the expansion of the universe, after he proved uh, sometime in the late 1920s, I think uh, 27 or 29, some uh, 1929 or so, uh, he proved that the universe was expanding. He calculated the expansion rate, and that is basically the rest of the, uh, that gives you the uh, age of the universe, the radius of the universe, and so on. And what he calculated was just uh, four uh, billion years, the age of the universe, according to the calculation of the Hubble constant at that time was just four billion years. So I feel very amazed that our ancestors would come out with about two billion years for the age of the universe, uh, maybe a thousand years ago. Uh, later on, after Hubble proposed this age of the universe, uh, people doing the dating techniques became very sophisticated and people were able to find rocks right on Earth that seemed to be older than this. The uh, Earth, the solar system, uh, the Earth maybe four and a half billion years ago. So they found rocks on Earth that were older than four billion years. And that created some problem at that time. And then they went back and uh, re-measured the Hubble constant, tried to increase it every now and then. And that in the previous slide, I told you 13, uh, 13.8 uh, giga years for the age of the universe. Even recently, within 10 or 20 years ago also, they had to keep increasing because you see they were finding galaxies almost at the edge of the universe. The first one I showed to you, the, uh, uh, the farthest galaxy, 13.39 giga years. It is almost at the edge of the universe. And with the measurement of the Hubble constant at that time, uh, this would have been outside the universe. So they have been revising things, methods and calculations to keep increasing the uh, age of the universe by billions of years at a time. And when I was, uh, I was attending some conference and they told one of the speakers there said that cosmology is one subject where you can make, easily make mistakes of uh, billions of years. It doesn't make any difference if you make a, uh, uh, make a, uh, your errors are of uh, billions of years. So uh, now I don't know if you people may be too small, but many of us recall in 2012 there was a big scare in the world. Some people, the doomsayers, they are saying the Earth would be all destroyed in 2012 because it turned out the Mayan calendar uh, was counting up to only 2012. The calendar ended in 2012. So they said the whole world would get destroyed in 2012. And they are still continuing. I think last time they, when they turned on the LHC, they were saying that these uh, physicists, they are going to destroy the earth, create a black hole at LHC and uh, that black hole will swallow up the earth. And uh, people were asking me what is happening on the TV or to go. And what I said was that the amount of energy <clears throat> that is, being explored at uh, LHC is much, much less 
then the cosmic rays the energy of the cosmic rays deposited deposited at the upper atmosphere on very near to us and if these energies were producing black hole then we would have these cosmic rays would have produced black holes many times and would have all dissolved into into it so uh, well there are very often there are these doomsayers that keep appearing and saying the world will be destroyed or something even recently i think they were, they were saying that the asteroid will strike the earth and uh, maybe destroy everything and all the time i say these things are a kind of a double edged sword the earth was formed by accumulation of all these asteroids together and uh, even the water on the earth many people believe that it had been it has been transported to the earth by comets and so on and if the asteroid had not struck the earth in the time of the dinosaur probably we would not even have been here the asteroid wiped out the dinosaurs and uh, we are here so all this creation and annihilation done by the same thing two sides of the same sword uh, when nature turns it swings it one way the, there is creation when she swings it the other way there is destruction okay something more physical now uh, i think most of you have seen this picture this is the planck picture the planck satellite measured the background radiation that is all around i think you all of you know about the cosmic microwave background radiation and uh, they measured it and the anisotropy in it so the hot spots are shown in red here and the uh, cold spots are low density region in blue uh, all these dots probably developed into galaxies uh, this is a picture of the universe uh, just about 300000 years after the uh, big bang at the time of the uh, formation of hydrogen the formation what is called the recombination uh, this is called the last scattering surface uh, before the neutral atoms formed the radiation was locked with the atom with the atoms the charged particle not atoms the charged particles ions you know photon interacts with charged particles so the photons were locked with the charged particles as the universe cooled up and the temperature went below around uh, 3000 kelvin or so uh, as the energy of the electrons went below the ionization energy of hydrogen the electrons were captured by the protons and hydrogen atoms formed and that is called recombination and when all uh, the neutral atoms formed then the matter became transparent and the radiation has been just flowing around so as you map the uh, the what is called the cosmic background radiation it contains a picture of the universe as it looked uh, 300000 years after the big bang and all these spots the red spots that you see here they have grown into galaxies and clusters of galaxies uh this picture actually is what is called the planck enhanced anomaly 
you don't see this in the plank picture they have uh, made it more clear and this white line through the picture they call it the axis of evil uh, and one side appears to be hotter than the other this is more hot but more than that actually i see ripples like waves here this point on the lower right side within the white circle is described as the coldest point in the universe it is a big void with very little density of matter and they don't know how this has come about there are very exotic uh, things they, with which they try to explain it uh, some people saying maybe this is a, a point through which our universe is leaking into the into a parallel universe or something they have fantastic ideas they have not been able to explain this and that's why they you expect the universe to be homogeneous and one side turns out to be quite somewhat different than the other side which is very uniform uh, well i have done some work i told you i used the newman penrose method to part up the uh, the cosmological equation the friedman equation of for cosmology uh, and uh, i don't think these are so fantastic with the universe leaking or something into the parallel universe and so on i think it has to more to do with uh, gravitational radiation you know just like this background microwave background radiation there is a background gravitational radiation also uh, we have very recently been able to detect the gravitational radiation uh, i think it will be maybe more than 100 years before they will be able to uh, detect the background gravitational radiation and i think this must be due to the effect of the gravitational radiation gravitational radiation is a quadrupolar radiation and uh, obviously it would uh, divide it into these things but uh, i have all the equations here but i just need someone to maybe try to uh, do some simulation with matter in it and uh, see whether you get some kind of a structure like this or not <clears throat> so with electromagnetic radiation we can look at the universe to only up to uh, 300 300000 years after the big bang uh, and uh, before i say that maybe it, at this time the temperature was around 3000 kelvin now the background temperature is 3 kelvin the ratio of the temperature is the ratio of the scale factor so the universe in almost in more than 13 billion years this 300000 amounts to nothing in the 13 billion years that we are talking about the universe uh, uh has expanded by about 1000 times in linear scale maybe 1000 doesn't look very big to us uh, but uh, in terms of volume if you cube 1000 it is much bigger and again 1000 is a very large number actually so as i was saying if you can detect the gravitational radiation that was is all around us just like the cosmic background radiation then you can see the universe when it was still younger 
the neutrino radiation takes you to if you can measure the neutrino background radiation and make a picture like this it will show you a universe uh, that was just 3 minutes old and probably the gravitational radiation would take you even to the very point of the big bang almost to the big bang itself or to the planck time after the big bang when the gravitational radiation decoupled uh well now the uh many people are not really satisfied with the big bang model there are some uh, acute problems with it uh and most people do not basically like the singularity at the big bang when the when at that time the density of the universe was infinite temperature was infinite you cannot have infinities in physics you know uh, physics has to measure quantities and you cannot measure infinite so uh, people are not very all are not very satisfied so although the big bang gives us a very nice picture of the universe uh, to almost uh, its very origin uh still there are some problems uh maybe and they hope that a you know, theory of quantum gravity would solve it but no one has a, a theory of quantum gravity yet <clears throat> and penrose the same penrose he has written many popular books i think among them the uh most uh, popular may be the emperor's new mind uh, he is very deeply involved in trying to explain the consciousness and trying to develop a unified theory of everything he has proposed a uh, quite a different idea that is called the ccc the conformal cyclic cosmology and what he suggests is that as the universe keeps on expanding you know there is the dark energy the cosmological constant that is causing the accelerated expansion of the universe as it continues with this expansion then at a certain point it un undergoes a conformal transformation and maybe the very big universe will tunnel through into another big bang and start another universe so he has devised whole method and uh, newman and penrose they got together and did some calculations also uh, to determine this kind of uh, thing and uh, according to penrose again each cycle of this big bang is supposed to last to maybe 10 to the 100 years so again this 100 years is a very big number the just unimaginable and a big number uh, way beyond the uh, billion years uh, 10 billion years or so that we are talking about uh this is a picture of what penrose was trying to is trying to suggest the universe undergoes the big bang keeps expanding and somehow at this crossover it conformally tunnels into another big bang and so on uh, through a number of cycles and each of the duration of one big bang he calls it an eon and the eon he just su suggested maybe 10 to the 100 years a number they call it googly i think a very big number uh this is what 
he got again the same background radiation the picture i had shown you with blank uh, the measurement of the background radiation uh, this was done a little earlier this is the kobe the data from the kobe experiment that was before the blank the nasa put up a satellite called kobe the background uh, cosmic background explorer and they measured that satellite measured the microwave background radiation around and he did some analysis and came out with these circles the what he calls the circles in the sky and he says that these circles are evidences of the universe going through a number of different cycles uh, the the book itself is very interesting the conformal cyclic cosmology at that time i was able to download a pdf version of that book somebody had put it up i think i don't know if it is still there or not but it is a very interesting book to read and uh, if you have time you should read the other books by penrose also the uh, the emperor's new mind and so on and uh, there is another very interesting book not such fantastic and things but uh, what he calls the road to reality it is a big book that tries to describe the way that people are trying to unify the theories of the universe uh then again there is this large number of hypothesis of dirac i'll not go into the details again it was noted at that time that the ratio of the radius of the universe to the radius of the electron happens to be equal to the self energy of the electron and the self energy of a hypothetical particle the gravitational self energy of a hypothetical particle of a, so these two numbers turned out to be same and uh, dirac developed a, a whole theory based on this large number hypothesis that many ratios of the biggest thing we can see and the smallest one they should all come out to some value like this uh, let me now very this is probably the last slide i have uh, how these even bigger numbers are coming around the total number of particles in the universe uh, this can be constrained very easily the number of baryons in the universe can be constrained very easily by the nuclear abundance the nuclear nuclear abundance is one of the most successful uh, calculations of the big bang theory and uh, it exactly gives the value of the abundance of hydrogen helium uh, beryllium and all the light elements lithium and so on to well, exactly to what we observe and uh, any excess of baryon would give a different number and any uh, uh, lesser than this 10 to the 80 would give a different value so by comparing with what we observe uh, they have come out with this value for the number of baryons in the universe and also there is another quantity called the uh, baryon 
the photon baryon ratio and it turns out that there are 10 to the 9 a billion more photons than baryon so the basically the total number of particles in the universe is basically the number of photons you can multiply a few times by the number of neutrinos and so on it just adds on a few factor in front maybe three four five or so and it doesn't change very much this 10 to the 89 is basically the number of photons uh, and that is also the entropy of the universe most of the entropy of the universe is contained in the relativistic very fast particles if you multiply this number by the Boltzmann constant you get the uh, entropy of the universe uh, and I was looking at the I was searching for the estimate of the entropy and some I just came across a paper in which a person has estimated the entropy of the cosmic event horizon you know the uh, the surface area of the black hole horizon is the black hole is proportional to the entropy in the black of the black hole as proved by hawking so similarly the entropy of the cosmic event horizon should be the uh, entropy of the universe and that person has estimated about 10 to the 122 so and this number is almost approaching what is called the holographic limit of 10 to the 123 they suggest that uh, the entropy this is the maximum entropy this number times the Boltzmann constant should be the maximum entropy of the universe and uh, maybe I gave the name Pararda earlier maybe this 100 10 to the 122 or 123 should be the new so we should call the new parada or something like that okay now i think i'm almost i'm at the end of the slide this is the last one i thank you all for listening so uh, this is the end of my talk uh, if you want to ask questions maybe you can ask them uh, thank you very much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. Um, I hope uh, uh, the participant got an opportunity to learn more about uh, the universe uh, in very minute way. Uh, and uh, since uh, it will be recorded, it will be live. It, it is being live and it will be recorded in our YouTube channel. Uh, so uh, people can watch it uh, afterwards. Um, well, if they have any doubts, uh, and then they can also reach reach us so that we can reach you. Uh, they can reach you directly. Uh, we we had a couple of questions listed. Mm, uh, let me start a question uh, from uh, from the uh, YouTube because there are people watching. Uh, they cannot participate here. Varad uh, Chitich uh, in YouTube writes, "What actually is holographic universe?" Um, so he wants to know more about holographic universe. Oh, uh, well, I don't know very much in detail. No, I don't know anything about this. But I think the idea is that comes from the higher dimension. Uh, the string theory proposes maybe 10 dimensional string and uh, similarly the uh, uh, so it appears that all these higher dimensions have to be projected into our four dimensional space. So that means that uh, 
everything people are saying maybe this is like illusion maybe what we see is not even real everything is projected like in the movie into a four dimension and uh, so uh, this is basically the holographic projection i don't know the details the technical details of it i'm very sorry uh, okay sir uh, there is another question i would quickly like to put in front of you uh, from youtube channel uh, who are watching live uh, lok narayan pokhrel says uh, what exactly may be the terms brahma vishnu and shiva are they be as human that sense and think for some reasons or any other entities dear sir please explain my little well i don't <laughs> again i don't know <laughs> very much about this uh i think they just represent some symbols people wanted to explain things and uh, they have mostly symbolic meanings uh, maybe they expanded from a uh, Uh, previous uh, things like again uh, if you study the i had written an article sometime in uh, uh, in rising nepal uh, called das uh, avatar there are two articles one called das avatar and another uh, called the cosmic dance or something uh, you can look it up in my research gate uh, profile there they are there uh maybe uh, these are stories and things that have been collected from very long time ago you know the vedas they they could they are not even able to write it had to be carried out by word of mouth it was written down only much later so uh they may have been inspired by real person like indra for example you remember the story about indra with his bajra uh, bajra is basically a stone that has fallen from the sky so one of the meteorites or something and at that time when people were just in the stone age uh, making weapons and things with stone any person that picked up a meteorite a very hard meteorite metal meteorite with uh, and could sharpen it to uh, very sharp points would have the most effective weapon so uh, it may have been inspired by some real heroes of uh, some time but uh, they have added so many things that now i think they are mostly just uh, a uh, symbolic representations of uh, various aspects of nature thank you very much sir before we take another questions from this uh, webinar platform uh, i request those who are watching us live on youtube uh, uh, if they have any queries they can post over there and we'll try to answer them as possible and now it's time to take some questions uh, i would like to ask uh, mr ani ashish dahal Uh, to to present his questions on his own uh, please anish uh, you you can uh, ask your question okay thank you very much sir <coughs> mm, my question is if the universe as you said earlier the universe is 13.8 giga years old so how come the size of the universe become more than 13.8 giga light years since particle cannot exceed the maximum speed of light or uh, and since there is traces of galaxy found beyond that how is that possible uh well as i said uh, people have been improving on the hubble constant to accommodate these things uh again uh, i showed you the galaxy that has that is the farthest object i looked up uh, just when i was preparing for it and the farthest object they have found was that galaxy i mentioned in the talk some 13.3 uh, or so giga light years billion light years away 
that is still inside the Hubble radius. Hubble radius is 13.8. Sometimes at the very beginning when they start finding it, uh, they somehow overestimate and it turns out that maybe it lies outside the universe, but uh, they do, do they redo calculations and I, I don't think uh, there are any confirmed thing that is beyond 13.8 uh, uh, giga years, uh, giga light years away. But one very important thing, uh, there is another quantity called the dark energy, the cosmological constant, and it exerts negative pressure. Uh, it produces another horizon. There are various horizons in the universe. The Hubble horizon is 13.8 uh, giga light years away, the particle horizon and uh, so on. And uh, the de-sitter horizon that is due to the cosmological constant is much farther away. The cosmological constant, the lambda is what is causing the inflation and so on. So probably the uh, de-sitter horizon uh, in the inflation also, during inflation also, the de-sitter phase, during the de-sitter phase, the horizon expands at a rate that is faster than the speed of light. So probably the de-sitter horizon is receding at a rate that is faster than the speed of light. Okay, so we have another question uh, from uh, this webinar Zoom platform as well, uh, currently attending this here. Uh, Prastuti, I would like to ask her uh, to pose her question. Prastuti, you can speak now. Um, sir, namaste. No, sir. According to the first law of thermodynamics, uh, energy is energy can neither be created nor be destroyed. So, how can we say that dark energy is the cause for the expansion of our universe? Uh, uh, Prastuti, class class ten, right? Yeah, sir. Oh, uh, sir. Class ten student. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, that is true. The Energy cannot be created nor destroyed, but there is a snag to that. Uh, you study conservation law in school and all, but as you go on and uh, you learn about quantum mechanics and uh, so on, then you see, you'll find that these conservation laws can be violated for very short times, as long as it is within the uncertainty limit, the Heisenberg uncertainty limit, conservation of energy can be violated. And there, I have a better thing. I think Hawking was asked at that time uh, when he, after he wrote the grand design, the, where he said that uh, gravity creates something out of nothing. So it turns out that with gravitational interaction, like I, I told you, the de-sitter horizon is uh, receding at a rate that is faster than the speed of light. So under gravitational interaction, where you have these horizons, even in the black hole horizon, uh, if the gravitational interaction sweeps away the anti-particles or particles of what are called negative energy, then uh, you end up with positive energy. And that's why Hawking said that uh, Gravity can create something out of nothing. Uh, thank you, sir. We have another question. Uh, let's move to our YouTube channel. Uh, there are people asking questions, so let's take one. Uh, 
by uh, Mijash uh, Tiwari. He writes, how can we uh, actually start research in cosmology? It would be great help if you give synopsis about how you started research. Uh, in, uh, at what level is the person studying? I think he's doing a master's now. He just finished his uh, graduate uh, undergrads from Pokhara uh, Prithvinarayan campus. Oh. Uh, well, at the master's level, maybe uh, there are many open problems, I think, uh, that can be explored. Uh, like the dark matter itself. There are many proposals for dark matter, what could constitute the dark matter and so on. So uh, there are ideas about uh, Bose-Einstein condensates and various things. So you should maybe uh, the cosmic background radiation itself, they are finding new things. So there are a lot of open problems, I think, you can explore in the internet itself and uh, find out. Or you can revisit any worked out problems with more details uh, so that uh, it constitutes uh, new research. So there are many ways, I think. Uh, we have another question uh, at this platform. Uh, I ask uh, Jeevan Shrestha uh, for his question. Jeevan, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir, for such a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, actually, uh, I teach science uh, to high school students. So not only whenever, whenever I teach science, so I just have to teach them very small quantities like the atoms and very large quantities like universe. So how do you think yeah, I can actually explain this infinitesimal and such astronomical units for them to understand? Thank you. I, I didn't get the last part. How you can explain what? Uh, how, how do you think that we can explain these very small numbers and very large numbers to the, to the students? Uh. <laughs> Well, it's a very difficult thing, I think. The, it is the whole expanse of physics from the quark at the femtometer scale to the universe at the, uh, at the uh, billion light years scale. Uh, well, uh, I think last year, one uh, couple a parent called me on the phone and uh, they said that they have a son, I think he's studying maybe in two or three class and he is very interested in this uh, kind of thing and uh, just he has heard about me so we wanted to meet me and so on. And after some time I said, okay, if you are so oh, uh, insistent, and I called that person along and I started with the same example. I, uh, he knows that, that kid was very uh, knowledgeable. I don't know from where I asked them from where he found out and they, they say he works on the internet and tries to get new information, ask teachers and so on. And so uh, they came some from her, somewhere from Vaisipati and I asked that kid, you know, uh, you call out, you say that the universe is 13 billion years and so on. Uh, do you, can you imagine how big these numbers are? And I started with a similar example. I asked him, you came from your house to my house. Uh, so how far do you think you have traveled? And uh, he thought for some time and uh, he came out with quite a good answer. I think he said around uh, five kilometers or so. And I said, that's very good. And then I went through the same example. You multiply that by 10, you get the uh, maybe 
uh, two times the ring road or something and uh, i extended that same example and uh, tried to uh, show to him that uh, these big numbers the 10 to the power of something is a very deceptive kind of uh, measurement that is uh, difficult to actually comprehend to say it is easy but to comprehend is very difficult so you start i think with examples uh, a drop of water i gave you an example the uh, just 18 gram of water is holding 10 to the 23 molecules so uh, maybe then you can maybe ask them to think of what the size of the molecule is and uh, so on okay okay so uh, thank you sir so we have uh, another participant uh, who wants to ask uh, to you uh, alish alish takal uh, please uh, ask a question Alice? Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, sir, as our topic is our uh, how universe, uh, how big our universe is. Sir, it is valid to say that how big our universe or we have to say how big our observable universe. And apart from that, as we know, as the universe is uh, expanding and accelerating, can we able to measure how big our universe with more accurately and more precisely? Well, you are very correct, observable. Physics has to observe. It can only measure what it sees. So that's why I told you the infinity and the zero are unmeasurable. They are not even physical. So again, so we can only look out up to the Hubble horizon. That is also the limit. We cannot at the Hubble horizon, the event horizon, uh, there are a number of horizons, the Hubble horizon, the event horizon, and uh, again, I told you the Desitter horizon and so on. So we cannot see beyond the event horizon. The event horizon, as I said, uh, as Hubble said, the galaxies are receding far, faster and faster as we go further and further out. So basically at the point of the Hubble horizon, the, not the Hubble again, the particle horizon, the particles, the galaxies are receding at the speed of light. So basically you cannot see that point because the any emission from there would be infinitely red shifted. So what we see is inside that. And uh, as I said, uh, it is almost, at the edge of the universe itself. So 13.8 billion years. You are very, very correct. I think the uh, observable universe, the 13.8 billion years is basically, we can observe within that, not that point itself, but within that. Thank you, sir. So we have another questions we are taking from a YouTube channel, uh, from the people watching us live. Uh, Diksha Neopane writes, uh, do we study something that's already there or something new to explain what's there? Oh, what? I, I didn't, the first part. I uh, uh, do we study something uh, that's already there or something new to explain what, what is there? Oh, okay. Uh, physics is an observational or experimental science. So you have to be, it is not possible to do experiments in cosmology at all with uh, gravity, particle, particle physics and things you do experiment. The LHC is doing experiments to verify the uh, various theories, the electroweak theory the discovery of the Higgs particle, uh, uh, verified the electroweak theory of Abdus Salam and uh, uh, Weinberg and so on. So basically we make 
observation the scientific method what is called the scientific method the baconian uh, method is to observe some uh, uh, something that happens some event observe some event uh, could be a falling body or something then you try to explain you develop a theory to explain the event or how it has occurred and your theory should be predictive it should be able to give answers to questions that have not been done by experiments so you extrapolate and find a answer from your theory and then you do experiment again to verify that answer so that is the experimental method of science it a uh, theory is good as long as it is verified up uh, any up uh, any contradiction there are many compete there are many competing theories for electric weak unification but only the uh, salam model survived and that survives as a theory so your theory should be able to explain what happens and also what could be what could happen okay so it is based on observation basically okay uh, thank you sir there is another question i'm taking from youtube uh, devesh uh, youtube writes can 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 you elaborate uh, on parallel universe on so he wants to know uh, parallel universe so he wants to know uh, more on parallel universe oh, again, sorry i cannot give much detail on that but again they come with this higher dimensional things uh, so they think that maybe the actual universe is of higher dimension than uh, what we see and these are all projected onto lower dimension so you have uh, sheets of it could be continuous sheets but when they come close together then there is a, a par what could be called parallel universe sheets we can do example only in two dimension maybe two or not two also difficult so sheets of parallel although it is they are continuous sheets when they come together then light can only travel along the continuous thing along the sheet that is the space time but again you need these warm holes and things to travel between the sheets so uh, maybe if you fall through the black hole and survive maybe you will emerge at in a parallel universe or something like that <laughs> okay so there is another question i'm taking from youtube uh, ishita sharma writes can quantum fluctuation be a valid reason for why there is something is nothing yeah that's true uh well uh, the quantum vacuum is something that is very different from what we think of as vacuum uh it is even proved experimentally the casimir effect was ob observed long time ago it is the vacuum fluctuation basically the, it just proves that the vacuum is full of particle antiparticle pairs that are continuously being created and destroyed and again as i so that is the quantum fluctuation the uh, particles and antiparticles are continuously being created and destroyed and if there is some interaction like the gravitational interaction that sweeps out the antiparticle 
then what you'll be left with will be just the particles and that is uh, creating things out of nothing. So, yeah, uh, what you say is correct. Okay, uh, um, I hope uh, that that satisfied uh, the question. So we have another participant raising hands in this uh, webinar, Asis Kiri. I allow him to ask his question. Asis, please, please go ahead. Hello, sir. Like uh, we talked about the cosmological constant. I, I wanted to ask that, uh, does there exist any metric solution that describes the space-time properties uh, near the dark energy and dark matter? Like you you did a matrix solution and like Schwarzschild matrix and other metric solution. Does there exist any uh, metric solutions that describes the space-time nature near the dark energy and dark matter? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. the Dieter solution is basically with a cosmological constant. So the paper I showed you at the beginning, the rotating black hole in asymptotic de Sitter space. So that is a black hole that is inside a de Sitter space. So my motivation for working on that problem is that from the very beginning, you know, I've been a kind of a partisan for the cosmological constant. I like the cosmological constant very much and I worked with it with black holes in space with cosmological constant. And uh, at that time, most of the well-known physicists were very reluctant to admit there is cosmological constant until the late 90s, I think, at that time, uh, in the 90s, 1990, uh, the people discovered accelerating universe which could be done only with the cosmological constant so yes there are solutions the friedman solution itself the desitter horizon can be incorporated in the friedman equation so instead of friedman equation now they call it the fr i don't know if the sequence is correct frwl l stands for le matre who tried to, uh, when Hubble showed that the universe was expanding, he tried to explain the expansion in terms of the de Sitter things. So uh, all solutions for black holes and the universe can, uh, they have nice solutions to include the cosmological constant. Okay, so we have another participant who wants to ask a question to you. Uh, Dipanch Regmi, uh, please uh, ask your question. Dipanch? Um, hello, sir. I just wanted to ask this. What scientific problem do you believe, if solved, can be a major contribution to humanity? Example, mass of neutrino and so on. Well, <laughs> again... This is quite speculative, but uh, there is no question that the neutrino has mass. Only the question is how much mass, and it has come down, they have constrained it to a very small value, I think. They are expecting it in the range of a EV or so, maybe less than that. So a very light particle. Uh, I think the, again, I've been saying the major uh, thing is the quantum gravity itself. If they can devise a method to quantize the general relativistic equation, the Einstein equation, then that would be a major breakthrough for physics. Uh, okay, so let's take another question from uh, YouTube. Uh, there is Yamuna Rana. She writes, I have heard about Omniverse, the extreme point of universe that can be imagined. Can you please give some information related to that? So Omniverse, you want some information, if you can put uh, some light. <laughs> I'm very sorry. I think these students are more up to date than... I am. Uh, I have not heard about this. 
thing that you have, you have just mentioned. So I'm sorry, I cannot tell much about it. And I can see you raised. Uh, so Unique, uh, can you ask your question? Unique? Yes, sir. Uh, hello, sir. Hello. Hello, please. Hello, Unique. We hear you. Please ask your question. Uh, if uh, we know light is also matter, if uh, uh, we know black hole is absorbing light, then if, uh, if it will affect the orbit of the planet because light is also matter. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question very clearly. May I ask in Nepali? Yeah, yeah. Uncha, uncha, please. I don't know if light is not a matter, but I don't know if light is not a matter. I don't know if light is not a matter. I don't know if light is not a matter. Black hole is not a matter. I don't know if light is not a matter. I don't know. Yeah, I'll answer the clear. I have a question to black hole matter. Hands up, can you emit it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have a question. I have a question for you. What do you want to say? He writes that we all know light also cannot escape from black hole. We all know light also cannot escape from black hole. Will light affect the gravitational pull? As we now we know, we now uh, we know light is matter, so mass of black hole will also increase. So let's suppose sun will be black hole. Will it affect the orbit of Mercury if black hole only absorb light? So he was thinking that sun will turn to a black hole. What happens if sun becomes black hole? Will it absorb Mercury or not? Oh, oh okay. Uh, there are various things. Uh, there is a no hair theorem of Hawking and Penrose again, which basically says that you cannot determine what a black hole is made up of. So a black hole could be made up of only light, photons, only neutrons, protons and electrons, and so on. Uh, you cannot, from outside, you cannot tell what it was made from. Uh, the only thing you can measure from outside are three things. The mass of the black hole, the uh, angular momentum, if it is rotating, all the almost all the black holes are rotating, so angular momentum of the black hole, and if it is charged, the charge of the black hole. But even if it is a charged black hole, I think it will, it will attract the opposite charges from the matter around and neutralize very soon. So only three things can be measured from outside. So you cannot tell if the black hole is made from, from photons or from neutrons. And now regarding the sun turning into the black hole, uh, the orbit of the, if you think of a, some kind of a stellar system with mass exactly the same as the sun's mass and it's, at the same distance as our planets, then their orbit would be the same as with our planets, with the planets here in the solar system. But the formation of the black hole is very violent. So uh, if you have the, obviously the sun cannot turn into a black hole because its mass is too little and it will die off as a white dwarf after another maybe some 5 billion years or so. But uh, nonetheless, uh, the black hole formation is so violent that uh, it has to undergo through supernova explosion. So things, the orbits would be very much disturbed. But again, uh, uh, if uh, you think of a stellar system with a black hole and planets 
planet at the same distance and same angular momentum as the earth around the sun the orbit would be the same it would not be different so uh, let's take a question from uh, youtube uh, lucky sajit uh, said says uh, uh, i want to ask what do you we mean when we say there was nothing before big bang what is nothing is this is it the empty space or what so big bang <laughs> well that's the problem i was telling you about the why people are not satisfied with the big bang model uh, the singularity is a very uh, i don't know what to say it is not very physical the the mass the density is infinite the temperature is infinite the size is zero and so on so it is very unphysical nothing can be like that so uh, according to the classical theory the big bang theory itself the big bang is the point at which all space and time uh started there was no time before that there was no space before that so uh, you cannot even talk of what was before the big bang you cannot say there was nothing uh, because there was no time even so it is not at all possible to uh, talk uh, to say anything about the uh, point at the big bang okay so um, let's uh, take another question from youtube uh, people watching uh, from youtube uh, sabin pokhrel writes notion of space time does not make any sense below planck scale why uh, just uh, what i just uh, told you okay the uh, well the planck scale are some indications of what would happen with Uh, quantum gravity just uh, some indications and uh, just like uh, when people started to do the quantum when quantum theory started to quantum effects started to become evident people were looking at small scales earlier light seemed to be like wave that was a continuous stream of energy not particles but a continuous uh, some kind of uh, uh, continuum uh, but then when it interacted with atoms and things the exchange in energy was uh, coming in uh, uh, discrete uh, uh, quantities so that gave rise to the idea that light consists of discrete energy a quantum of energy called photons so uh, same thing with space now space and time is space time a continuum that flows uh, time continuously from uh, flows on const- continuously and is space also a continuum or is it discrete like light and uh, so on so at the present the planck scale appears to be the the planck length for example appears to be the smallest length scale that can be so if there is a space time quantization then it should be in units of the planck length and planck time at that scale space will not look continuous but maybe there were many theories at uh, earlier that did not survive very much like the uh, hawking itself he talked about space time foam maybe space time is not continuous but uh, like foam of uh, soap or something with discrete space time units so that's basically then these things should be small uh, maybe i don't know if it is good to say that but maybe small black holes of the size of the uh, planck 
length and so on. Okay, so let's take another question. The, I can see that uh, the hand is raised by Sagar Giri. Uh, so I would like to ask him to uh, pose his question. Sagar Giri, please. Thank you, sir. So I have heard that you have broken the Einstein's law of relativity and claim it to be wrong. Is it true, sir? And what's your further steps on it? Well, what do you say? I don't The sound is not coming clearly. Sir, I have heard that you worked on the Einstein's theory of relativity and claim it to be wrong. And is it true, sir? And what's your further steps on it? Uh, no, no, I don't think that maybe. Uh, I don't know, but uh, I'm a relativist. I have nothing to go against Einstein. The only thing is that, uh, uh, well, I basically solved uh, the wave equation in a medium and uh, was able to show that uh, in a conducting medium, the waves uh, could travel at speeds greater than that of light. The effect is basically what is uh, basically tunneling kind of thing. And uh, at the quantum level, uh, the tunneling effects, uh, they do occur at greater than speeds of light. Uh, that was just a result, I think. And uh, well, maybe I leave it to the experimenters to verify it. Uh, maybe a sheet of graphene or something, try to pass a beam of laser through a sheet of graphene or something and find out if it uh, if such a result is possible. But again, there are many things that are still un not understood about the uh, relativity of Einstein. So there are many things to know. Uh, and Einstein himself, you know, the gravitational radiation, at one point he, found, he said that there is gravitational radiation, then Another time he said there can be no gravitational radiation and so on. So uh, unless, as I said earlier, unless experiment shows something to be true, we cannot take it to be true. So there, I can see there are some uh, hands up by Nishchal Khakurel. Uh, I ask him to pose his question. Nishchal, please go ahead. Uh, hi, Professor. I just wanted to ask, why is everything rotating in the universe? Uh, you have uh, another question as well, right? <laughs> yeah, and then I was going to ask, is there any scope? What's the future scope for physicists who are in abroad right now? Uh, well, the first thing why everything is rotating uh, at the very fundamental level, particles have spin. The electrons have spin. Um, even neutrinos have spin and uh, so on. So uh, they all have the spin angular momentum. What spin actually means may be a complicated thing, but all have angular momentum at the very fundamental level. And you know that there is conservation of angular momentum. So anything made out of these particles should have some angular momentum. Uh, that is basically means that everything will be uh, rotating. Uh, there are certain instances like anti-ferromagnetic material where the uh, spins align in opposite direction and uh, so on. But again, generally, in most normal circumstances, there would always be a residual angular momentum in particles, made in composites made out of 
particles with angular momentum. Okay, so we have a question from Binod Kumar Pandey. So I ask him to ask his question. Uh, Binod, uh, uh, please go ahead with the question. Please ask your question. Hello, Professor. Hmm? Yeah. Hello, please, please ask a question. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I think in this universe, there exists some other energy in a medium than vacuum that can propagate faster than light. What is your idea about that? Yeah, I just told you that. Uh, in the medium, it appears to, things appear to travel faster than light. There are many instances, even in astro astronomy, they see uh, things, the jets from the black hole, uh, many matter ejected from the black hole along the jets appear to travel faster than light. Uh, you can look up in the internet, I think, superluminal motion, they will come out with thousands of papers uh, telling you that uh, they have measured things moving at speeds faster than light. So what the cause is, I think I saw on one paper just very recently which seem to say that in medium, it appears that uh, things can move faster than light and that probably confirms what I did also. So uh, let's uh, take some questions from uh, YouTube uh, that uh, uh, Him Sagar Rai writes, sir, who or what was thing to motivate at your related field at the beginning of your time. Well, what is that? Uh, so, if, oh, it's just went up uh, just a moment. Sorry for that. Uh, the Hem Sagar Rai writes, uh, who or what was the thing that motivate at your related field at the beginning of your time? Uh, what motivated me to study physics? Uh, yes. Ah, uh, okay, I told this story sometimes, I think, to some, uh, to some uh, reporters, some news people. Uh, I was very small, I think, maybe two or three, three years old or so. Uh, at that time, uh, in my house, uh, my father had put up the electrical lights, you know, they, it was... The lights were just coming, I think, from purping or something, and it was very dim. But I was very fascinated. You turn on the switch, immediately the light comes on. So I asked him uh, in what area they teach about this electricity and light and so on. And he said physics. So from that time, I said, I'll study physics, I'll study physics. and. Uh, even before I went to school, I was saying I'll study physics. Okay, I think uh, that that uh, answers him, uh, <laughs> the one. That is, uh, we have another question from Hem Bindu Sresta uh, from YouTube. How can we explain that universe is expanding for kids in a very simple words so that they can understand easily? Well, the first thing you should uh, note is that the expansion is at a very large scale. Uh, only when you go to very distant objects will you see expansion. Uh, nearby objects are coming together. For example, the nearest galaxy to us, Andromeda. It is, and our Milky Way galaxy, they are collapsing. They are coming towards each other, and all of them are falling into the 
Bhargo cluster and it appears that the whole Bhargo cluster is falling into something bigger called the great attractor and uh, so on. So only at the scales of uh, super cluster or even bigger super super cluster is the expansion uh, visible. But the best ex example I can think of to show how the expansion is occurring is to take a balloon and uh, before uh, blowing it up, you put some marks with a pen on the balloon. And then you blow the balloon to a bigger size. Uh, you'll find that the distance between the marks that you have made has increased. The marks are at the same point. The marks do not move. So it is a wrong concept that we keep coming across that the universe is expanding and one galaxy is running away from the other and so on. That is not a, the real picture. The picture, the real thing according to relativity is that the galaxies are fixed at points, but the space between them is expanding. So that's how at the very point of the Big Bang, there was no concept of, there was no quantity like space and time. Space and time was created at the point of the Big Bang and the space between galaxies is expanding, not that the galaxies are moving away from each other. Uh, there are peculiar motions and so on, but I'm talking about the whole cosmic Hubble expansion. Okay, so we have uh, another question. It says anonymous attendee. I don't know who he, he or she is, but uh, right, sir, you talked about Brahma relating to this. So do you think God exists? Uh, well, I don't know what you mean by God, but uh, uh, I don't believe in some person that is outside the universe and controlling what is going on in the universe. If there's a God that should be inside the universe itself. So if you want to call the whole universe God or nature God, then that is fine with me. But uh, no one can control. I don't, I don't think there is some entity who is controlling what happens in the universe. Uh, अब ब्रह्मालाई नै विधिको विधान लाग्छ भने त्यही विधि नै चाहिने सुप्रिम हुनु पर्यो सो नेचर इज सुप्रिम फर मी नेचर इज सुप्रिम एन्ड नथिंग अबव नेचर ओके सो लेट्स टेक अनदर क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम युट्युब फ्रॉम द पीपल वाचिंग इट क्विक फैक्ट्स आई डोंट नो हु ही और सी इज राइट्स इट इज सेड दैट देयर इज अ लूप होल इन द स्पेस दैट कनेक्ट्स वन गैलेक्सी टू अनदर गैलेक्सी हाउ फार इज इट राइट so he wants to know about loophole. Is it right uh, that connects two galaxies? I don't know what do you mean by loophole, but there are filaments. Okay, they see these all computer simulation of the Big Bang universe uh, came out with these filaments that connected uh, every mass to 
another. Uh, these filaments had more mass around them and so on. Uh, this was coming out in only in numerical simulations, but nowadays I, have, I find that they have devised a method to look at these filaments and uh, they have seen such filaments in astronomical objects and it appears that every astronomical object is connected to another with these filaments that are basically higher density matter than the surrounding. Okay, so uh, there, there are some uh, questions uh, from YouTube again. Uh, Ramesh, Ramesh writes, people used to say that our universe is expanding faster than the speed of light. How does it possible? Yeah, I think I already answered that. The Desider horizon, if there is dark energy, then the Desider horizon must be expanding at speed faster than that of light. So we have another last, I think this is the last question because we are taking too much of your time. It's already four, uh, two minutes to four. Uh, the last question uh, is uh, uh, from Anonymous. Uh, so how do you calculate the distance of galaxies? So it's quite, uh, wants to know how we calculate galaxies. Uh, okay, so that is a very nice question. A very practical and thing. Hubble was the first person who did that, I think, uh, as far as I know, there were some indications earlier also, but Hubble was basically able to identify the various objects, some of the nebula, like the Andromeda and so on, as a different galaxy. Uh, and he did that with what are called the c variable. There are certain stars in the galaxy that are called the c variable. They happen to lie in the constellation Cepheus, a particular galaxy, particular Cepheus galaxy. These c variables are such that their luminosity varies periodically. And by studying the c variable in our galaxy and measuring the distance to them by parallax method, uh, the spectroscopic parallax or the real parallax or anything, uh, they were able to find out a very good relation between the time period of the variability of the c variable and their absolute luminosity. So when Hubble analyzed the data for c variable in the, uh, in the Andromeda Nebula, for example, he was able to, with the time period of the variability, he was able to estimate the absolute luminosity of those uh, of those stars. And from the apparent luminosity that we receive here, uh, the one by R squared intensity relation, the inverse square law, he was able to calculate the distance to that c variable. And it turned out to be much, much bigger than anything with the stars nearby. And from that, he concluded that the Andromeda Nebula was a galaxy by itself. So they extend this method further. And I think the last one, the, the, how they found the accelerating universe was by estimating again the absolute luminosity of the supernova explosions. And from that, calculate the distance by the one by R squared law. Uh, thank you very much for your valuable time uh, for us, uh, answering all these queries and entertaining these questions from both YouTube uh, people watching us and asking questions from YouTube as well as uh, attending this uh, webinar here in Zoom. 
Um, so we would like to thank you for your valuable time and your expertise. I hope uh, uh, we will be working with you uh, in future on the problems that you want to work on, uh, which you already have put some theories on it and want, looking for some simulators. Uh, people were uh, having experience in simulation. So uh, at the end, uh, is there anything you'd like to say to the youngsters out there, uh, the people watching us and listening to us? Uh, is there any message uh, to them, sir? Uh, uh. Okay, my message is that you keep being inquisitive, asking questions and so on. Uh, and asking questions is a very difficult thing, actually. Uh, the question has to be relevant and uh, so on. So nowadays with all the information uh, available on the internet and so on, you hear a lot of words like the parallel universe and uh, so on, but uh, what they actually mean uh, is very difficult to understand. So you keep being inquisitive, asking questions, trying to find out answers. Asking the relevant question is already, they say, halfway to the answer. Okay. Okay. Okay, Bharata, Suresh ji. Uh, so thank you very much for your valuable time. So we hope to have you again uh, with us uh, for other, uh, another, another topic which you are working on or you're interested uh, to have students working on or you want to encourage and empower students to work on. Um, so with this note, uh, I would like to thank everyone who joined us today in this platform. So we received 197 applications uh, through our registration form. And there were, I can see that there are people watching us live from YouTube, about 30 people. Uh, and uh, of course, this video will go in the YouTube channel, so which people can watch later on. Uh, through our YouTube channel called Nepal Astronomical Society. If anyone search, then they will find us. Uh, with this note, uh, I would like to thank everyone and special thanks to uh, Professor Sir. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us and have a good day to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.